Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the general principles of law and in this lecture we shall have a look at rights and duties. Now we have seen before that law consists of those principles in according with which justice is administered by the state. And justice is the property of being fair to everyone. So law is a set of those principles. It is a combination of those principles that the state uses to administer justice. So justice is administered in accordance with these principles which are known as law. Administration of justice has behind it the physical power of the state for the purpose of enforcing rights and punishing the wrongdoers for violations. So when we talk about administration of justice, it can only be done if there is the might of the state behind the laws. So the state ensures that if there is any law and if somebody violates that law, then this person is brought to task. This person is punished. Only that can ensure that people follow the law. So administration of justice has behind it the physical power. Physical power means that people can be arrested, people can be detained, people can be put in the jails, people can be punished. All of these is the physical power of the state. It is doing things physically. It's not just a moral power or a persuasive power. So it has behind it the physical power of the state. State in this context means the government. For the purpose of enforcing rights, and punishing the wrongdoers for violations. So the state is doing two things. It is enforcing the rights. It means that if people have certain rights, then these rights should be guaranteed. They should be enforced. So the state is doing two things. One, it is providing these rights to the citizens. And two, it is ensuring that if any of these rights is violated, then the person who does the violation is given a punishment. So, there are two purposes for the purpose of enforcing rights and punishing the wrongdoers for violations. Thus, every right involves a title of a source from which the right is derived. And the word title may be understood as the de facto antecedent of which the right is the de jure consequence. What does this mean? This is talking about where do we get the rights from? So, for example, in the case of India, we get our fundamental rights from the constitution of India. So, in this case, the right that is the fundamental right involves the title of a source from which it is derived. So, this title of the source is the constitution of India from which this right is derived. The word title may be understood as the de facto antecedent. De facto means in fact. Antecedent is coming before the right. And the right is the de jure consequence. De jure means of law. And it is the consequence that is, it is coming out of this particular source. So the title is the de facto antecedent of the right. And the right is the de jure consequence of the title. And every right involves a title of a source. So there is a source that gives people different rights. Now, when we are talking about rights and duties, the next question that arises is what, how do we define a right? What are these rights? Do rights just mean freedoms or liberties? What is a right? So how do we define rights? In an abstract sense, right refers to justice 
एथिकल करेक्टनेस और हारमोनी विद द रूल्स ऑफ लॉ और द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ मॉरल्स सो इन एन एब्सट्रैक्ट सेंस वी कैन से दैट राइट इज समथिंग दैट इज रेफरिंग टू जस्टिस और फेयरनेस सो वेन वी से दैट पीपल हैव द राइट टू इक्वालिटी इट मीन्स दैट इक्वालिटी इज गोइंग टू गिव पीपल एन अमाउंट ऑफ फेयरनेस इट विल अलाउ पीपल टू हैव अ फेयर प्ले इन देयर लाइफ and that is from an abstract point of view so in the abstract sense a right is referring to providing people with justice so morally or ethically we should not be discriminating against people we should not be putting somebody in a disadvantaged position so we can take this from an ethical standpoint as well ethical or a moral standpoint or we can say that right refers to harmony with the rules of law or the principles of morals so right refers to harmony with the rules of law rules of law means that you should have a supremacy of law there should be nobody who is above the law even the government even the law makers should be bound by law you should have equality between everybody and you should have some sort of judicial supremacy that is all the administrative and legislative actions should be just judiciate judiciated upon by the courts so if the administration is doing something wrong the courts should have the power to say no if the legislature is doing something wrong the courts should have the power to say no so that is the rule of law and in the abstract sense right refers to harmony with the rules of law that is if the rules of law are there in a country then we will say that people have rights if the rules of law are getting violated that is the legislature is making any law any fanciful law based on its whims and fancies then we will say that people do not have rights because even if there are certain rights they can be abrogated or they can be removed at any point of time so right in an abstract sense is the state where everything is harm and it's in harmony with the rules of law or the principles of morals so it is saying that in an abstract sense right refers to harmony with the principles of morals that is if everybody is following the morals everybody is doing what is morally and ethically correct then we will say that people have rights otherwise people don't have rights because people would be able to uh, move upon or encroach upon or violate the rights of others if they are not morally sound so these are rights from an abstract sense now of course when we talk about the abstract sense it feels good to talk about these terms it feels good to say that right is all about justice it's about morals it's about ethical correctness it's about rule of law but then how do you define it from a legal point of view when do you say that there is a right and when do you say that the right is not there so for that we come to the concrete and legal definition of right so right refers to a power privilege demand or claim possessed by a particular person by virtue of law so in the concrete legal sense right is a power what is power power is the ability to make somebody do what he or should she does not want to do that is power so for instance if everybody wants to encroach upon your property then the right is the power to ensure that people are not able to encroach into your property so even though everybody wants to come and have a share of your property then too if you have the right then you have the power to stop these people to make them go away which they do not want to do themselves so in the concrete legal sense right is a power it is a privilege it is a privilege with a certain set of people it is a demand or a claim that these people have on others 
so they can demand others that you have to do this they have a claim over others so that is a right so right is power privilege demand or claim possessed by a particular person or a set of persons by virtue of law so how are people getting these rights they are getting these rights out of certain laws so if the laws do not say that there is a right then there is no right and the right will only be there when people get these sorts of powers over others now rights and duties are interrelated each legal right that an individual possesses relates to a corresponding legal duty imposed on another that is when we say that right is referring to a power possessed by a person then this power means that the second person has to do something so each legal right that an individual has relates to a corresponding legal duty imposed on another there are no rights without duties and there are no duties without rights for example when a person owns a home and property he has the right to possess and enjoy it free from interference of others if you own a home you have the right of possession and you have the right of enjoyment free from the interference of others so others cannot get into your house others cannot get into your property without you wanting it so this is your right the right to say no to others the right to remain protected but in return others are under the corresponding duty or obligation not to interfere with the owner's rights by trespassing on the property or breaking into the home so your right to enjoy your property is corresponded with the duty upon others to let you enjoy so every right has a duty attached with it now let us look at certain views on rights now views on rights are important because they allow us to look at rights from different perspectives from different angles so these are the legal luminaries and these are their views on rights salmond says that right is an interest recognized and protected by rule of law so right is an interest over something and this interest over something is recognized and protected by the rule of law if you do not have the rule of law or if you have a rule of law but it is not recognizing your interest in something it is not protecting your interest in something then it is not a right and we saw before that protection means that you should have the physical might of the state the state or the government should be there to say that okay this person has such and such rights if anybody is violating this right then he or she will have to suffer the consequences because we will use our physical might to punish that particular person only then the right is going to remain so right is an interest that is recognized and protected by the rule of law it is any interest respect for which is a duty so because somebody has an interest others have the duty to respect this interest and the disregard of which is a wrong so if somebody disregards this interest if somebody violates this interest interferes with this interest then that is a wrong so in this view we have defined things like right we have defined duty and we have defined a wrong so right wrong and duty are all interrelated every right that a person has corresponds with a duty upon others to do something or not to or refrain from doing something and if this duty is not followed then there will be a consequent wrong so this is one view on rights austin says a party has a right when another or others are bound or obliged by law to do or forbear something towards or in regard to him so austin is saying that a party which means a person or a group of person and so on so a party has a right when 
another or others that is one person or many people are bound by law obliged by law to do something or to forbear something that is to do something or to refrain from doing something towards or in regard to him that is if you have the right to enjoy your property others are obliged to allow you to enjoy this right and others are forbeard from interfering in your enjoyment of rights so every right binds others to do something or to forbear from doing something and this binding or this obligation is because of a law so if there is no law there is no right holland says a right is the ability possessed by a person to control others actions so we saw before that right is a power so this is the ability possessed by a person to control others actions and self protection with the help and assistance of the state so right gives you the power to control others actions so others just cannot do what they might have wanted to do so you it gives you the power to control their actions it gives you the power to self protect protect yourself and you get this power with the help and assistance of the state so the if the state or the government does not provide you with this help or assistance then you will not be able to enjoy your rights so this is another view then dr setha says a right is any interest either vested or created under a law or under a contract so similar to salmond he is saying that right is any interest now this interest may be vested on to somebody that is given to somebody or it may be created so a new right can always be created under a law or under a contract so you can also get rights not just through laws but also through contracts now there are five characteristics of a legal right one there is a person who is the owner of the right he is the subject of the legal right sometimes also described as the person of inheritance so whenever there is a right there is a person who has this right if you have the right to property then you are this person so every right has a person who is the owner of the right and this owner is also known as the subject of the legal right he is also known as the person of inheritance for this legal right so these are two different terms a legal right accrues against another person or persons who is or are under a corresponding duty to respect that right such a person who is under a corresponding duty to respect a right is called the person of incidence or the subject of the duty so right gives the owner the power against other people and these other people whether it be one person or whether it be many persons who have the duty to respect the right are known as the persons of incidence who have to follow the right or subjects of the duty so you have the owner of the right and you have the people who have to perform a duty corresponding to the right then you have the content or substance of the legal right may be an act which the subject of incidence is bound to do or it may be forbearance on his part so the next thing that the rights should specify is what is the substance of the right what is it that these people who have to follow the the duty what are they bound to do or what are they required not to do so that is the content or the substance of the right then the fourth thing is 
the object of the right, the thing over which the right is exercised, also known as the subject matter of the right. What is this thing over which you have the right? If we are talking about property rights, then the property is this particular thing. So, the right has an owner, the right has the persons of incidence who are duty bound, there is a list of things that these people have to do or forbear from doing and there is also the subject matter of the right. And the fifth thing is there is a title to the right, that is the facts that show how the right is vested in the owner of the right. This may be by purchase, gift, inheritance, assignment, prescription, etc. So, when we say that you have the right over a particular property, say the right over a house, then title is asking the question, how did you get this right? So, this getting of right can be say through purchase, if you purchase the house, you can get it through inheritance from your parents, you can get it as a gift or there might be a law that says, okay, you have this right such as the fundamental rights. So, in the case of fundamental rights, the title is coming from the constitution of India. So, these are the five characteristics or five components of the right, the person of inheritance, the person of incidence, the substance of the right, the object of the right and the title of the right. So, these are the five characteristics. And every right involves a threefold relation. It is a right against some person or person. And these person or persons are the persons of incidence. So, this is a right against somebody. It is a right to some act or omission of such person or persons. That is, it is a right that has the substance. And it is a right over something to which that act or omission relates, that is, it is the object of the right. So, there is a threefold relation, it is right against some person, it is a right to something, to some act or omission and it is a right over something, which is the object of the right. Now, rights have corresponding duties, so what is a duty? Duty means a legal obligation that entails mandatory conduct or performance. So, if you have a duty to do something, it means that you are legally obliged to do something. It entails a mandatory conduct, mandatory means it is a compulsory conduct. You cannot say that I am going to do it or I am not going to do it. You have to do it. So, the duty is a legal obligation that entails mandatory conduct or performance. For example, with respect to import or export of goods, a person has a duty to pay taxes owed to the government. So, when we say that the person who is importing or exporting goods has the duty to pay taxes, then there is a legal obligation. Paying of taxes is mandatory conduct. You cannot say that I am in no mood to pay the, the taxes. You cannot evade these taxes. If you evade them, then you would have done a wrong. A fiduciary, so a fiduciary relation is a relation in trust. That is, if you are doing something on behalf of others, so that is a fiduciary relationship. Now, a fiduciary such as an executor or a trustee who occupies a position of confidence in relation to a third person, owes such person a duty to render services, provide care or perform certain acts on his or her behalf. So, if somebody has a fiduciary relationship, they are acting on behalf of others, they are occupying this position of confidence in relation to others, then they owe these other persons a duty to render certain services. If there is an executor of a will, 
then the executor has the duty to ensure that the will is correctly executed. So that is a duty because of this fiduciary relationship. You can also have a trust based relationship where you are obliged to do something. For example, if there is a minor child and the court appoints a trustee to take care of the rights of the child, then this trustee is duty bound to, uh, to give prominence to the interest of the child. So that again is a duty. So a fiduciary who occupies a position of confidence in, rela in relation to a third person owes such person a duty to render services, provide care or perform certain acts on his or her behalf. Now, if there is a fiduciary relationship, then the fiduciary cannot say that I am not going to do these because duty means he has a legal obligation for this mandatory conduct. It is compulsory. If you are a fiduciary, you can either do these things or you can say that I may be excused, in which case another fiduciary will be appointed. But you cannot remain a fiduciary and not do these things. So there is a mandatory conduct because of law. In the context of negligence cases, a person has a duty to conduct himself or herself in a particular manner with respect to another person. So people have a duty to conduct themselves in a particular manner. For example, a lawyer has a duty towards his or her clients. A doctor has duties towards his or her patients. A teacher has duties towards his or her students. Now, if these people do not do their duties, then there will be a case of negligence. So, this is what it is saying. In the context of negligence cases, a person has a duty to conduct himself or herself in a particular manner with respect to another person. So, they are duty bound means that there is a legal obligation of a mandatory conduct. You cannot be a doctor and not do these mandatory conducts. If you do not perform your mandatory duties, there will be a case of negligence against you. Now, on duties, Salman says, a duty is an obligatory act. So, you are under obligation to do it. It is an act, the opposite of which would be a wrong. Duties and wrongs are correlative. The commission of a wrong is breach of a duty and the performance of a duty is the avoidance of a wrong. So, basically what we are seeing here is that you have rights and every rights have corresponding duties. So, if you have a right, then it is a duty of others to do something. If they do not perform these duties, then you then they will be doing the wrongs. So, basically these three rights, duties and wrongs are correlated. So, Salman is saying a duty is an obligatory act, the opposite of which would be a wrong. So, if you do not do your duty, you are doing wrong. And if you are doing a wrong, it means that you are not respecting somebody's rights. So, duties and wrongs are correlative. Commission of a wrong is breach of a duty. If you do a wrong, it means you, are, you have not done your duty. And performance of duty is the avoidance of wrong. So, if you perform your duty, it means that you have avoided doing anything wrong. Now, these duties can be legal and moral duties. So, there are certain duties that you get out of certain laws and there are certain duties that you get out of the moral principles. Now, if somebody does not follow a legal duty, then that person will be punished by law. But if some person does not do a moral duty, for which there is no legal duty, then the person will not be penalized by law. A good example is that 
it is your legal duty to follow the road rules if you are driving a car so if you do not follow these legal duties then you will be sentenced you will be punished but then if you find that a child is drowning it is your moral duty to protect that child but if you do not do your moral duty you let the child drown then the law is not going to prosecute you the law is not going to penalize you because it is your moral duty it's not your legal duty so these duties are differentiated you have legal duties that are backed by the legal sanctions and you have moral duties that may be backed by things like social sanctions so if you let the the child drown probably people in your society will not like to talk to you if they think that you were in a position to save the child but out of laziness you did not save the child so the law will not do anything but the society that is upholding these moral morals might act against you so there are legal duties and there are moral duties similarly you have positive and negative duties positive duty is a duty to do something and a negative duty is a duty to refrain from doing something for example in the case of roads a positive duty would mean that it is your duty to have your license it is a, your duty to have all the paperwork in your vehicle so that is a positive duty you are compelled to do something a negative duty means that it is your duty not to do rash driving so that is a negative duty you are forbid or you are uh, refrained from doing something that is rash driving so you can have duties that are positive duties and duties that are negative duties then you can have primary duties and secondary duties now primary duties are your fundamental duties they are irrespective of anything else for example it is your primary duty not to uh, damage somebody's property that is your primary duty now the secondary duty kicks in when a primary duty has not been followed for example if you have damaged somebody's property then your secondary duty is to provide that person with some compensation an adequate compensation so you can have legal duties or moral duties positive duties or negative duties and primary duties and secondary duties so these are the various kinds of duties now after duties let us have a look at legal wrongs now legal wrong means a violation by one individual of another individual's legal rights so what is a wrong a wrong is a violation of a right and it is done by one individual or a group of individuals towards another individual or group of individuals rights now every right is capable of being violated so there is a wrong corresponding to every right for example a right to receive payment for goods sold implies a wrong on the part of the person who owes but does not make the payment so this is what we saw before every right has a corresponding wrong rights and wrongs are related together because wrongs are violations of rights and if there is a right there is a wrong so every right is capable of being violated and so there is a wrong corresponding to every right so similar to what we said before there is a duty corresponding to every right and similarly now we are saying that there is a wrong associated with every right and we have already seen that there is a wrong associated with every duty although the law is intended to establish and maintain rights yet in its everyday application the law must deal with both rights and wrongs so we require laws to establish and maintain rights but it is not enough to say that you people have such and such rights 
because the law also has to deal with what will happen if the rights are violated. So the law also has to deal with wrongs. So this is what it's saying here. The law is intended to establish and maintain rights, yet in its everyday application, the law must deal with both rights and wrongs. And how does the law do this? The law first fixes the character and definition of rights and then seeks to secure these rights by defining wrongs and devising the means to prevent these wrongs or provide for their redress. So the law first fixes the character and definition of rights. So the law tells what are the rights that are there with different people. What is the definition of these rights? What are the characteristics of these rights? And once the law has fixed or established what are the rights, then the law seeks to secure these rights by defining wrongs. So, for example, if you look at the Indian Penal Code, you will find a list of all kinds of wrongs. Wrongs like murder, wrongs like theft, wrongs like robbery. Now, the IPC is talking about all the wrongs. But it does not mean that there are no rights. If we say that murder is a wrong, then it means that there is a right of people to stay alive. There is a right of people not to be killed by others. And there is a duty to others not to kill people. So rights, wrongs and duties are all related together. But in its day to day application, it is easier to define the wrongs and prescribe punishment for the wrongs, then it is just to say that you have such and such right in an abstract sense. So the law has to deal with wrongs. So the law secures the rights by defining the wrongs. So it defines what kinds of offenses are there, what are the wrongs, and then it defines means to prevent these wrongs or to provide for their redress. How do you prevent a wrong? By the legal sanction. So the IPC prescribes different punishments for different wrongs to ensure that people do not do these wrongs and the rights are maintained. If we talk about civil rights, then, you, then the civil law deals with what are the kinds of redressals or compensations that people will get if their civil rights are violated. So, the law defines rights, then it secures the rights by defining wrongs, devising the means to prevent the wrongs and provide for their redressals. Now, Salmond has this to say about wrongs. A wrong is simply a wrong act, an act contrary to the rule of right and justice. So, basically, wrong is just a violation or something that is contrary to right and something that is contrary to justice. And a wrong may be described as anything done or omitted contrary to legal duty, considered in so far as it gives right to liability. So wrong is a violation of the legal duty as well, anything done or omitted against the legal duty. And if you do a wrong, then it gives you a liability. So it gives you certain sorts of punishments, it gives you certain obligations that you need to do. And wrongs are again of two kinds, legal and moral wrongs. So just like we have legal and moral rights, similarly we have legal and moral duties and now we are seeing that we have legal and moral wrongs. Now, we can look at laws based on wrongs. So, public wrongs are violation of public rights and duties that affect the whole community, that affect the public. Public wrongs are violations of public rights and duties. Public means affecting the whole community and the criminal law is charged with preventing and punishing public wrongs. So, if you have a set of laws that is trying to prevent and punish the public wrongs, 
then that law is a criminal law because when we talk about crimes crimes are offenses against the whole society it's not just an offense against a person it is something that is abhorrent to the whole society so that is criminal law so criminal law deals with public wrong or public rights or public duties a private wrong also called a civil wrong is a violation of public or private rights that injures an individual and consequently is subject to civil redress or compensation dealt with by civil law such as the law of contracts so a private wrong or a civil wrong may be a violation of public or private rights so you also have public rights here but the thing is here we are not talking about the injury to the community but we are talking about injury to a person injury to an individual and this injury is subject to civil redress or compensation so if a person is injured then the person should be given certain civil redresses or compensations to compensate for these wrongs and the law that deals with private wrongs is known as the civil law such as the law of contracts and a civil wrong that is not based on a breach of contract is called a tort so tort is one kind of civil wrong that is not based on the breach of contract examples include things like assault battery libel slander intentional infliction of mental distress damage to property and we'll have a whole lecture de devoted to torts tort basically means twisted so you have a twisted liability if you do not perform your duties so if you do some things like assault battery libel slander infliction of mental distress and damage to property then you will have to pay for these and that is tort the same act or omission that makes a tort may also be a breach of contract so if there is a civil wrong then it might include breach of contract and it might also include components that are not a breach of contract the same act or omission that makes a tort may also be a breach of contract but it is the negligence not the breaking of the contract that is the tort for example if a lawyer is negligent in representing his client the lawyer may be sued both for malpractice which is a tort so basically it is saying that the lawyer did malpractice that is he was negligent and because he was negligent so he has to pay for it and also for breach of attorney client contract so he can be sued for both of these things together and tortious liabilities are dealt with by the law of torts now let us look at the classification of rights according to their objects now based on their objects you can have rights over material things such as property rights in respect of one's own person personal rights right to reputation right in respect of domestic relations rights in respect of other rights rights over immaterial property and rights to services so these are all different kinds of rights based on their object so you can have proprietary rights you can have non proprietary rights you can have right to reputation right to domestic relations so these are all different kinds of rights based on their objects now let us look at the kinds of legal rights how do you classify legal rights now the classification talks about perfect and imperfect rights a perfect right is one which corresponds to a perfect duty and a perfect duty is one which is not merely recognized by law but is also enforced an imperfect right is a right recognized by law but is not enforceable due to its form or some other defect so if there is a duty which is recognized by law and is being enforced then it is called a perfect duty if it is only recognized but is not being 
enforced then it is not a perfect duty it's an imperfect duty and perfect duty corresponds with a perfect right that is you have a right that is recognized by law and the right that is enforced imperfect right is a right that is recognized by law but is not enforceable positive and negative rights positive rights provide the right holder with a claim against another person or the state for some good service or treatment so if you have a positive right then you have a claim over others to get something a negative right restrains other persons or governments by limiting their actions towards or against the right holder so basically positive rights ask others or give others the duty to do something and negative rights force others not to do something so that is positive and negative rights then you can have rights in rem and rights in personam a right in rem that is a right against a thing is a right exercisable against the world at large for example if you have a right to anything if you have a right to property then this right to your property entails a duty over all the other persons on this planet so that is a right to a thing a right in rem a right in personam entails a duty over only upon a particular person or a set of person for example a a patient has a right in personam over his or her doctor it's not a right over thing it's a right over a person so right in rem is a right exercisable against the whole world as contrasted from a right in personam which is against a person which is an interest protected solely against specific individuals then you have proprietary or property and personal rights the aggregate of a man's proprietary rights constitutes his estate his assets or his property so the sum total of proprietary rights that is property rights is the estate of a person also known as the assets of the person or the property of a person if he owns land or chattels or patent rights or the goodwill of a business shares in a company or if debts are owing to him that is other people have to pay him back all of these rights pertain to his estate so all of these are property rights the sum total of a man's personal rights constitutes his status or personal condition so what is your status your status is the sum total of your personal rights and what are what is your status you can be a free man you can be a citizen you can be a husband you can be a father and the rights to which the person has as such pertain to his status or standing in the law so there are rights to properties and rights to your person that is your personal condition or your status next we can also divide rights into inheritable and uninheritable rights a right is inheritable if it survives the owners that is it passes from the owner to the heirs and a right is uninheritable if it dies with the owner so it extinguishes with the owner next we have rights in re propria and rights in re aliena the ownership of a material thing means the ownership of a just in re propria that is right in re propria with respect to that thing a right in respect of one's own property so basically if you have a house that you have purchased yourself or you have the title to that particular house then you have rights in re propria over that house but then you can also have rights in re aliena which are rights available against the property of another person so for example if there is a person who has the house and this person has rented his house to you or given his house 
on lease to you then even though you do not have the ownership rights but you have some rights to inhabit that house and these are known as rights in re aliena so this is rights in the property of someone else these are rights in property of your own now rights in re aliena include things like lease servitude securities trust etc then we have primary and secondary rights or antecedent and remedial rights primary rights are also called antecedent antecedent means that it comes before sanctioned or enjoyment rights whereas secondary rights are called sanctioning restitutory or remedial rights primary rights are those rights which are independent of a wrong having been committed they exist for their own sake they are antecedent to the wrongful act or omission so basically if you own a property then it is your primary right that others should not disturb your property so right to the protection of your property is your primary right it is an antecedent right that is this right comes before any wrong has been done before your property has been damaged you have this right then you also have certain secondary rights they are part of the machinery provided by the state for the redressal of injury done to the primary rights that is if your property gets damaged by somebody then the secondary rights will kick in to provide you with certain redressal or compensation so somebody who has damaged your property has to pay you back some compensation which is an adequate compensation so primary rights are antecedent rights they arise before a wrong has been committed and secondary rights are subsequent rights they arise after a wrong has been committed then we have public and private rights a public right is possessed by every member of the public when one of the persons connected with the right is the state and the other is a private person the right is called a public right a private right is concerned only with individuals so public right is a right with the public with every member of the public for example the right to live the right not to get assaulted so these are public rights but you can also have private rights that are concerned only with individuals so if there is a contract then people can have rights over each other and those will be known as private rights so they are rights that are coming out of their own private dealings the state has got nothing to do with it the government has got nothing to do with it so those are private rights vested and contingent rights a vested right is a right in respect of which all events necessary to vest it completely in the owner have happened so it is now completely with the owner no other condition remains to be satisfied in the case of a contingent right only some of the events necessary to vest the right in the contingent owner have happened so for example if you have a person a and this person is the uh, father of a person b now if a has willed his property to b through will then b has a contingent right over this property because some steps have taken only some of the events necessary to vest the right in the contingent owner have happened and that is the will has been drafted so it is a contingent right but when a dies then all the steps have been completed so the will and this will has gotten executed so all the steps are complete so in that case b will have a vested right over this property so this is the difference you can have vested rights and contingent rights vested rights are those in which all the events have been done contingent rights are those rights for which some events have been done 
but the full enjoyment of the right is contingent over something else. Then you can have municipal and international right. Municipal rights are conferred by the law of a country. So these are national rights that you have within a nation. International rights are conferred by international law. So you have municipal and international rights. And then we also differentiate between ordinary and fundamental rights. Fundamental rights are guaranteed by the constitution. So the constitution is the basic law of the land and fundamental rights are guaranteed by the constitution. All the other rights are ordinary rights. So they are not guaranteed by the constitution. In India, we have six fundamental rights. The right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights and right to constitutional remedies. So these six kinds of rights are guaranteed by the constitution of India and so they are fundamental rights. Rights to everything else like right to property, right to have a good road, things like these are rights that are ordinary rights. So in this lecture, we looked at rights, we looked at wrongs, we looked at duties and we found that all three of these are very intricately linked together and we can differentiate between rights, duties and wrongs based on several characteristics. So we can have things like public, private, ordinary, fundamental and so on differences. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.